Okay, we are we are now live. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this virtual cabinet panel on the environment meeting that is being conducted with members and officers at various locations, communicating via audio, video and online. There is also the opportunity for the public and press to listen to and view the proceedings. We also have contributions from various organisations with us here to provide feedback. Before the meeting starts, I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer to take a roll call to confirm that required members, officers and participants can be heard. Thank you very much, um, Chair. When your name is called, please indicate your attendance to confirm that the required members, officers and speakers are present and can hear. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the committee members or the panel members, sorry. Um, Councillor Allen. Here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Councillor Jarvis. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Bryant. Here. Thank you. Um, do, we, do we have Councillor Cowell with us? I don't believe we do. No. Um, Councillor George Davies. Here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sarah Dingley. Here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morris. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Ruggiero Chakir. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Tyson. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, do we have Ruben Avayu? Present. Thank you. And Georgina Chapman? Hello. Thanks. And do we have Lynn Sini in the call as well? Good evening, yes. Thank you very much. Um, that's all fine. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, do we have uh, apologies for absence? I've received none. Are there any apologies? To report. Looks like a big fat no. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting. I propose that we take as read and approve as a true record the minutes of the meeting of the panel held on the 16th of November 2021. Can I have a seconder? Okay. Thank you, Gerald. Right. Uh, I would like to welcome members of the public, including our registered speakers, to the meeting and thank you for your attendance. In accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on mod.gov and the film recording by the NHDC YouTube channel. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and the speaking rights is set out under chair's announcements on the agenda. Please be advised that a supplementary agenda pack for item five has been published containing an updated version of the action tracker, which has been circulated owing to an administrative error with the original document. You might have noticed the date on it was not now. Right. Uh, does anyone want to notify me of any other business before we carry on? that we'll obviously discuss at the end. No, nope. okay, right. Can I just hand over to Ruben Aevo to present uh, the work program and action tracker, please? Um, Chair, I think Sue Lyons had a hand up. Oh, I haven't got anything up in the... Your physical hand. Ma, right, thank you, my apologies. Sue? Um, could we please have an item at the end to include notice of possible festivals and the relevance to the council, please? Certainly. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else? Digital hands, wavy hands. Michael? Um, you didn't mention uh, my name uh, as being present. Louis? Uh, sorry, Councillor, I wasn't aware you were a member of this panel. It's probably because you, it, your name is, says Galaxy A20 rather than Councillor Michael ah. here. Unfortunately, um, I've misplaced my laptop. Um, I haven't found it yet, so I'm on my phone. Sorry, Councillor, I will uh, mark you as, as present. Thank you. 
Right. Where was I? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if there's anybody else. No. OK, Ruben to present, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a double act today. Um, Georgina's going to cover the information note highlights there, and I will pick up the supplementary action track and work program. Am I going first? Yes, Not please. First? Yes, OK. Um, so the information note. So if we first of all talk about um, the, contri the contributions uh, that we've made to the Hertfordshire Climate Change and Sustainability Partnership, or HUCSP. So for anybody that doesn't know, that's um, a grouping, a partnership of all the district councils in Hertfordshire and the county council and the local enterprise partnership to work together on climate change and sustainability issues in Hertfordshire. <clears throat> so as part of that, North Hart's led on a biodiversity subgroup um, to create a biodiversity action plan. Um, and that is now adopted and it's on um, the website. If you Google HCCSP, Hertfordshire Climate Change and Sustainability Partnership, it should come up. Um, <clears throat> work is, uh, is now continuing to assign actions to officers for implementation and for monitoring because we've had a new project leads officer begin um, as part of HCCSP. So she's kind of working to define um, and prioritise the actions so that we can have some kind of uh, smart order in how we take them forward. Um, so we're currently doing that. Um, an action that was in the biodiversity action plan was around the creation of a biodiversity baseline. So looking across um, all the land in Hertfordshire to assign unit scores to different parcels of land and so that we know how much biodiversity is on that piece of land, um, which should kind of help us be strategic as we move forward. Um, and so WSP are carrying out that work for us. Um, and they're now, they've analysed the data and they're now conducting a quality assessment to validate the accuracy of that data. Um, and the results of that are looking really positive so far. Um, and we are we're on, on track for completion um, of that work around the end of the financial year. And WSP will be coming to HHSP in April to present on how that baseline can be used um, within local authorities. Um, we have completed a delegated decision for a county-wide solar bulk purchase scheme through the HCCSP. Um, it is waiting for approval by HCCSP, um, so it'll be taken to a meeting of HCCSP shortly. Um, it was delayed a bit due to kind of internal uh, authority approval processes at another authority, um, but it is it is still on track. Um, we are continuing to attend meetings of the behaviour change subgroup as part of the HTCSP, um, who've now kind of produced a draft action plan um, and are working to identify key action from each of the other priority areas, which are water, biodiversity, um, carbon reduction, transport and adaptation to kind of take forward um, as an initial step. Uh, we've got the Heat App Hearts Energy Advice Tool, which is an energy saving app for residents that you can download from your app store and um, it's now available um, and accessible and you can kind of go on it and it takes you through different rooms of the house and you can answer some pretty simple questions and it will kind of tell you if there's opportunities to reduce your energy usage and your bills um, and then we also attended a session on engaging the public on climate change um, as part of the HCSP, which was really useful and it was kind of covering the do's and don'ts for climate related communications which hopefully we can implement when we put out further communications. The other thing that's relevant about the HCCSP for tonight is that recently the HCCSP set up an adaptation subgroup that having identified adaptation as a key priority area for the county. Um, the subgroup is made up of officers from each of the local authorities and they will be responsible for creating a strategic action plan, which they then take back to HCCSP for approval. <coughs> Um, one of the first, there, it, it's in early stages because the subgroup's not long been established, but um, one of the kind of key priorities is um, for the development of risk assessments for the county. So some authorities already had risk assessments around um, the impact of climate change on council services, but now they want to take a, a broader look at the kind of wider impacts of climate change um, on the county and um, adaptation actions that could arise from that. Um, so that's that. Lynn, who's on the call, I think is part of that subgroup, but that's not what she's come here to talk about tonight. Um, and then if we talk about the climate change communications plan, so within North Hearts Council, the policy team has been working with the communications team to produce a climate change 
communication plan for the calendar year. So focusing on local and national environmental events and days. Um, so then we can put out relevant communications to residents. Um, we also gave a uh, climate and environment presentation for our councillors. We, we held a couple of information sessions for councillors to keep them updated on what we are working on around climate and, and environment. It gave an overview of COP26 and also the Environment Act uh, and the implications of that for local authorities um, and the work that we're doing as part of the HTSP and um, the kind of progress on our climate change strategy, including our carbon footprint and upcoming projects. <clears throat> the sessions were attended by councillors from all three parties. We had some really good um, feedback as well. Um, and there were various suggestions around kind of sharing um, our climate achievements more widely using it, using an infographic, which we produced. Um, so that's good. Green space management strategy. We've been involved in reviewing the upcoming green space management strategy um, to make sure it aligns with our environmental and climate change commitments. Um, we've written sections relating to our climate change strategy and HCCSP biodiversity action plan to make sure that that is all incorporated. Um, the 10,000 free trees, which we're providing to residents, I've been informed, have all been given away now. So they should be um, being nicely planted in gardens um, across the district. <clears throat> uh, we've set up an environmental inbox to allow members of the public or organisations to provide suggestions um, or presentations for the panel's consideration. Um, so just a, a reminder that that email address is environmentpanel at north-hearts.gov.uk. Um, and so if you have any suggestions for, for future meetings, please do um, email us. Thank you. Get myself off mute. So as uh, thank you, Georgina. As the chair said, I'll be referring to the supplementary um, piece of paper, which has the action track for February 22 as opposed to October 2019. Um, just to, uh, to remind members of the panel that of the topics that we've covered in the last year um, around leadership, behaviour change, renewable energy generation, waste minimisation, and tonight we're going to talk about adaptation to climate change. I think it'd be quite useful if we then, in our first meeting, probably do a review of what we've covered in the last year. Um, and then moving on to the action track, I've, I've changed the order of these. So I've put those ones, actions that are either ongoing or on hold towards the top, and then all the completed actions follow on from there. So just to highlight to the panel, we have three on four ongoing um, actions. The first is the survey of clients at the Best Before Cafe. We appreciate um, they've been quite busy, so I've not been able to get a chance to provide that survey to them and get it back from them. Uh, the other ongoing one is the anti-IV policy development and the smart card option for bus use and the review of the cycle to work and the institution of car free days and hitching. Um, the sustainable North Hearts program, which is being led by uh, service director of place, is currently is being developed, but they've had a change in officer. So that, that officer is going to pick that up and, should be able to provide an update to us shortly. Uh, in terms of the smart card option, the national bus strategy, it's one of their key requirements, but there's an unknown date as to when this is going to roll out. So I'll, I'll keep you informed as best I can there. And then the ones that are ongoing or on hold are the ones is EP 27, 34, 37, 38, which uh, talk about recycling in schools, eco-credentials for food outlets, uh, changing in weekly collections and recycle cups at district events. There's a national waste strategy at the moment. There's a consultation going on. Once we've had seen all the recommendations actions from that have been finalised, we will be able to put some actions to those or some commitments to those actions as it comes out. Have to take any questions either on the information note or the action tracker. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any uh, questions? for Ruben and Georgina. Diane. Georgina, there was a, an awful lot in your presentation just then. Have you got that written down somewhere? Roughly, it's in the information note. Have you got the, um, have you been able to download that from, from Modgov? No. 
Um, I can put a link in the chat, probably. We can send it by email if need be, Diane. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'd like to read it, then I can absorb what you said. <laughs> Sorry, I know I whisked through. <laughs> Got a lot to say. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, great. Um, in that case, we'll be moving on to uh, Lincini and her presentation. Let's bring up my statement. Here we go. Uh, the to, so we're receiving a presentation on an adaption to climate change. Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good evening, everybody. Um, I think it might be helpful for me to just give you a bit of background about why I'm giving this presentation because it doesn't actually fall in my area of responsibility. I'm responsible for Hertfordshire Leeds, which is the landscape, ecology, archaeology and design sustainability service that we provide to the district and the county uh, planning authorities. So it's a little bit outside my area of current responsibility. But the reason I think Georgina asked me to do this is because I'm formerly the um, Global Head of Sustainability for Parsons Brinkhoff um, and I've undertaken um, climate change adaptation strategies with a number of organisations and she wanted me to give you a sort of a flavour of what it's about and how you might do one and, and what you get out of it. So I'm going to talk to you about that. It's not a lecture. It should be hopefully an interesting tour of a couple of case studies. Um, and the ones I've picked are an airport because it's um, an example of an interesting critical system that government uh, defines as being part of nationally strategic infrastructure and also a hospital. Now, I can't share the hospital one with you because it is deemed um, confidential because of risk. But I can share the, um, the, the airport one with you because that's now a matter of public record. So um, if that's OK, I'm going to whiz you through that explain to you how we did it going uh, in the past and then have a bit of a chat about the implications for local government and what local government could do or lead or enable. So if that meets your approval, I'm just sort of looking over the screen at the moment, if that meets your approval, um, that's what I'm going to do for you tonight. So, nice. great. My next challenge is to make the technology work. So if you will excuse me uh, one second. Do I have the ability to share? Yes, I do. That's helpful for a start. But not that way, right. You've disabled my screen sharing, host? Uh, just give me one moment. I don't mind. I mean, we can do jokes. Um, and if you like, and how many sustainability professionals does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, well, the answer is, uh, do we need the light anyway? And is there no way we can just rub our legs together and create a spark? So there you go. <laughs> uh, could you try now? And see if yeah, it sure. That's better. Great. OK, so you should be something that is seeing a, a screen that reads uh, climate change adaptation in principle and practice. Is that yeah. good for everybody? Yeah. OK. And by the way, if you want to ask questions as you go, as we go through, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. So um, however you you wish to do it, Chair, whatever works um, for you. I'm happy for you to give your presentation. If um, uh, people want to ask questions, I might uh, suggest they be very short type ones, not lengthy statements, please. And uh, so that Lynn can give her full presentation. But okay. uh, yeah. So. Um, let's start with um, a little bit about the purpose of climate change adaptation. Why, why do we do this in the first place? Well, there's three major reasons. We know that there is already climate change going on um, and we can't control many of the impacts. So we have to learn to live with them. And the purpose of this is really to identify the risks that climate change causes to our everyday lives now and in the future. And where we can to remove those risks completely, so we might do something differently or we might relocate, or to reduce them to a manageable level. You have already seen some of the flood defences and such like in Shrewsbury or Shrewsbury um, that have been put up over the last few days. And that's an example of trying to reduce them to a manageable level. And the purpose of all of this is to make sure that we can live well and accommodate climate change. So it's both adaptation and it's also resilience and it's resilience for 
services, for assets and for communities. So all of us have seen these, these pictures in the news um, over the last year or so. Um, the top one um, is uh, North Hearts, as is the one on the left, Chris Wilson's picture of the tree that fell down in the, um, uh, the winds uh, the other day. But we also see things like an environmental drought. So there's a strong impact on nature and biodiversity as well. And that's a fish rescue in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, where the Environment Agency have got problems with a lack of oxygen, well, they haven't, the fish have got problems with a lack of oxygen saturation in the water because of falling water levels and a lack of turbulence. So they're now having to rescue the fish to try to keep them alive. Top, uh, the three on the top right, really, the petrol station is closed. That's because it also has implications on supply chain. So if you have severe weather and the uh, either the warehouse can't get stock out or the uh, haulier can't get something to you then you're going to have a supply chain issue and we need to think about supply chains too and of course the railway buckling under that well staff have got to get to and fro as well and as have service users um the other thing i think very important to think about what are the impacts of excess heat and who are they going to impact I mean, it sounds lovely doesn't it until you read that 2500 excess deaths occurred due to um, heat waves in 2019 and actually in France the figure was um, in the 30,000s in a, in a previous heat wave. It's very very uh, difficult for the human body to manage a sudden shock of a high temperature where they don't get any respite overnight. So if you have a high temperature overnight of something around 26 degrees your body can't cool and therefore you get um, no the, the body just basically overheats you go into um, a hyperthermia which is uh, not nice at all. And it's interesting that we're still designing some buildings without thinking about the uh, future implications of single aspect south facing flats in particular, which will have to be cooled. Um, and we really ought to be doing a bit more about interrogating design to make sure that the temperature projections for say 2050 don't mean that we're gonna have bedrooms that are so hot that the occupants gonna be nipping down to whatever we've got then version of B&Q and buying themselves a portable air conditioner and then overloading the grid. So there's a lot of reason for sort of thinking about these trends in the most macro sense, as well as in climate change um, adaptation on specific services. So when you're going to do um, a climate change adaptation uh, program, the first thing really to do is to think about your scope. And as I hinted earlier on, there's three scopes that people generally go for. So one would be the level of the asset. What will happen to my runway at Cardiff Airport? Or what will happen to my hospital building? What do I need to do to keep that operating um, if there is a, in, in during climate change? You can then expand that a bit to think about the service. Well, actually, if you're thinking about the passenger service, are they going to be able to get their tea and coffee? Are we going to be able to load and unload the baggage? Um, are they actually um, going to have a pleasant time as part of the journey or are the air, um, airlines going to moan that their passengers are being treated very badly? Thinking then, uh, taking that a bit further in health service, we're then thinking maybe about a department, about accident and emergency. And that's the same thing. How do we get blood to the hospital if we've got people that, that need that as a result of an accident? How do we get our staff in and out? Uh, years ago, I was a trainee paramedic and I had to work double shifts when it snowed because the incoming shift couldn't get in. And that's fine for two shifts, but you couldn't do three. And you couldn't do it on repeated days either. So it's starting to think about that wider um, aspect of A&E and then you can take that through to the systems level so if you're thinking about the airport as a whole what happens if air traffic control goes down what happens if it's no longer possible for anyone to get to the airport or the waste system packs up or there's no power so we start to think about it on as a systems issue and for the health service that way we start to think about emergency care in a geography how will we get medicines in how do we get test results what happens with things that can't be done at the hospital what happens if you need to transfer a patient Who's critically ill. So we, those are the sort of typical levels that you would pick on as a, um, a service provider or an asset owner. But for local authorities it's actually a little bit different because there's a lot more that local authorities can and might be asked to do and uh, we are expecting to see more guidance coming from government. There's the obvious one which is the assets and services under the council's control. So what do you do about um, if you're the county council, what do you do about waste collection? If you're the local authority, what are you doing about parks and recreation? What happens about Howard Park and the sprinklers when it's really, really hot and people need respite. What can we do there? 
There's also an advice and an influence level, and that might be to homeowners. Um, and you've started doing that with your energy efficiency um, work about because not only does energy efficient fabric keep uh, heat in, it also keeps heat out. I retrofitted my home in Letchworth and the maximum temperature it ever reached downstairs was 23 degrees when it was 31 outside. And in winter, it was snug as anything. It's really worth doing if you can get hold of the capital to do it. There's also advice and influence for um, businesses, and a lot of them are going to really struggle and have experienced this during COVID for perhaps the first time, a systemic shock. What happens when you cannot get goods to your shop or your staff cannot go in or you can't reach your, um, your purchases? So we now have a good starting point to work with businesses because they've experienced it. They've walked in these shoes. So we have an advice and an influence scope. There's a particular question about leveling up vulnerable communities. If you live, in, if you are someone who lives in poverty, your home is probably not very well insulated. If you live in private housing, a privately rented housing or your own housing, you probably can't afford to get yourself an air conditioner or you can't afford to flood proof your home or you have to go to work because you're on the gig economy or you've got no income or no sick pay. Or, and so you've just got no safety net. You have to go to work in a catastrophic event. You might find that very, very difficult to do. So sometimes you can look at um, climate change adaptation for particular communities, treating them as a system. It's also obviously important to work in partnerships at the locality level. Uh, North Hearts, you probably want to work with um, Stevenage and, uh, and other neighbouring authorities, particularly ones that share resources like Lister Hospital or who have to deal with um, the delights of uh, Great Northern uh, train service. So it is sort of thinking about what you might need to do at a locality level to make things work. And then of course, you're already pretty prepared to be honest on emergency planning. What do you do in a critical incident? And I think council certainly along the seven tonight will be um, exercising that function uh, very strongly and very carefully. So when we've done we've decided what our scope is going to be. The next question really is, what are the potential climate change impacts and how do we find out what they might be? Four sources, really. One's on historic data. So I know that the bridge, uh, the railway bridge at Walsworth floods underneath when I want to walk through um, at night in a severe rain event. So I know that. So we have local data, historic data, but also local experience. And one of the things that really needs to be done is to take advantage of those two immediate sources. You know where there are particular problems. We know which rivers flood typically. We know uh, which areas have struggled in severe heat before. We can also get hold of the uh, UK uh, climate uh, programme projections. Those are available online and some distillation has been done of those already. And you can also think about scenario testing, the what ifs. What if there was another very strong wind during a heat wave? What if? Uh, there was a, a flood and that knocked out a pumping station. Now, York had to deal with that because the um, Foss, the River Foss floodgates failed because the um, command room flooded, which is a bit of an irony, really, isn't it? So here's some of the information. This is from the uh, draft Hertfordshire County Council Climate Change Adaptation Plan. And what you can see here is some translations of what we expect to see happening in Hart. So they've done some of the work about the uh, the macro trends, what they haven't done is look at the local trends. So you get some information here at the a low scenario, we're expecting um, an average increase of 1.1% uh, by 2030 in summer. Um, if it's an extreme uh, carbon scenario, then we're expecting that could be 1.4% uh, by 2030. And then you can project almost to 2050 and 2080. So you can start to pull out um, some of the data and then you can augment that with the data that you're collecting locally. The next step is to unpack uh, the possible risks. Now, the risks are when you've got an impact that actually has an effect on whatever the scope of your uh, plan is. So it could be your asset or it could be your uh, service or it could be something systemic. It's unfortunately very rarely one input and one process and one output but it's sometimes very helpful to break it down into that. So when we were doing work at Cardiff, we spoke to baggage handlers and we found out how baggage handling worked and we interrogated that. And what do you do if it's so icy that actually you can't um, unfreeze the, the locks on the baggage delivery vehicles? What do you do if it's um, 
incredibly wet and actually you've got manual baggage handling, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start to unpick the various strands. And one of the ones that really surprised me that they were most concerned about, which was, what do you do if we can't get the goods into the airport airside shops? That's really interesting because actually it turns out most of the revenue for an airport operator comes from the rent charge to um, airside shops. So uh, really interesting, the direct revenue impact. So it's useful to often do this in a workshop form and to do it with knowledgeable stakeholders. And that usually means people who are operating the particular part of the service. And think about those impacts at an immediate level. What will happen if we've got um, an extreme temperature coming through in 2030 and also thinking ahead to 2050, what might those impacts be then? So there are two real types of risk and some of that is incremental. Incremental is a worry because people think, oh, it's slow, it doesn't matter, unlikely to happen. And suddenly you get a cumulative impact and all of a sudden you've got a real problem. So that might be something like um, aquifer um, recharging. We know they're getting charged less and less and less, but all of a sudden we've got a crisis because it's gone below the critical level. I've put some examples here. So if we were to go into the hospital again or thinking about the health service, we know that blood is carried around by motorbike quite often and it's carried in satchels. If it's 30 odd degrees, you need to cool those satchels. Otherwise, the blood will actually have cooked by the time you get to the hospital and it'll be black pudding, which is not at all useful. A sudden event might be a flood around a care home when you've got someone that's ill and needs to get out or you've got residents that are panicky or whatever else. So that, that would be a sudden event. At the service level, we know that hot weather gives rise to more particulate, more ozone pollution and other matters which affect people with breathing difficulties. So suddenly um, the service is going to have to deal with people with a lot more um, breathing difficulties in the summer. But then the critical events um, are likely to be heat stroke. It's sudden. We don't know someone's got a breathing difficulty. We suddenly got, I don't know, 200 people hit by heat stroke at a concert or at a, a scout camp or something like, or, or in an elderly person's home that's not properly insulated. Suddenly you've got a, a critical incident. And then that whole system approach, you suddenly, we're not dealing so much with deaths in the winter and bronchitis and such like a known pattern. The pattern has changed. We're now dealing with a much higher summer impact relating to weather than we expected in the past. And of course that has a knock on effect, pressure on ambulance and A&E services during a critical event. So if you had a lightning strike, or if you had um, something like a very sudden flood, suddenly all your emergency services are flat out and there's no prediction that that's going to happen. So here's Cardiff again. I really like the way that they set this out and this is subsequent to my involvement with them. They've actually done their risk analysis by climate change impact. So this one's snow. And you can see them working through what that means for different parts of their business. So we've got a summary at the top. They look at the current risk and then they look at the future risks. And you can see that they've actually started to um, bold up the ones that they think are more critical. So um, my comment on delivery of supplies to the airport. Yes, they've not been um, quite as straightforward as saying it a lot of it's for the duty free. But yes, there are real problems, particularly where you've got just in time deliveries and you need those to get somewhere during um, severe weather events. So that's an example of one way that you might choose to present it. It's particularly good if you want to share this type of information in, in a way that people understand and can get their heads around and doing it this way is really helpful. I'm going to show you some other examples which you might consider less appealing, but I'll show you those as we go through. Okay. This is a table from the Faculty of Public Health and it is part of a tool that they've given to um, a health... Uh, uh, not CCGs, the next one up. My apologies, I can't remember the precise term, but they've offered this to um, area-based health authorities. And they've looked at basically what the health impacts are and what the adaptation examples might be. And it's really to inform people and get them to think about what some of the risks might be. If you've got park staff and they're working outside in extremely hot weather, are they at risk of skin cancer? Are they at risk of sunburn? How do we mitigate against that? They've said provide shape. Frankly, I'd say sunscreen as well, but you, you get the idea. So we're, so we're starting to prompt people to think about issues that maybe wouldn't have occurred to them because it's not a typical issue. OK, 
okay, there's some other examples there. By the way, this slide pack is available, so I mean, you can read more detail later on if you wish to. Now, this is also from Health Service, and I've anonymized it a bit, but this is actually looking at what happens when somebody goes into um, accident and emergency. And what you can see is that there are multiple inputs and there are multiple interrelated systems. So there's interrelated systems within the hospital. So if someone hasn't turned up to do the x-ray, then we can't do the x-ray interpretation. If you need to send lab tests away, but you can't, then you can't finish what you're going to do. And you can have people stuck in the hospital because you can't discharge them because you don't know what's wrong. There's also a much wider interdependency, which is how on earth does the patient reach the hospital if it's surrounded by flood water? So that, that the interdependencies also go outside the area of your control, but it's something to think about and to make sure that whoever is responsible for the bit upstream or downstream, pardon the pun, has done their work on climate change adaptation. So this is what I meant by not a particularly appealing um, presentation, but this is the working documents from Cardiff Airport again. So what you can see is that they are dealing with rainfall and flood in this particular example. So they've identified a number of risks, uh, which can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, OK, so you've got a number of risks here identified. So they've gone through and taken all their um, different services and looked at what does heavy rain mean for those? One of the interesting ones, which, again, wouldn't really have appealed to me, uh, occurred to me, is that if you get wetland um, sitting around on the airfield, on the grass, you may well increase the risk of birds sitting on the wetland because they like it. And then you increase the risk of bird strike. Now, I'm scared enough of flying as it is. And the last thing you want is birds hanging around an airfield. So it's unusual. It's not something you think of when you design an airfield. It's something you think of all the time, but it's not something that you think of with a, with a future change in mind always. So they've been very clear where the problem is. They've been very clear who owns the risk, which is exceptionally important because you can then describe responsibilities. And they've given it a rating over time. Then they've said how likely they think it's going to be. So that's kind of the first step in your uh, risk identification. The next job is to assess them and prioritize them. Now, there are a number of different criteria you might use. And as a district council, you already have risk management frameworks in your finance department. Um, so you may want to look at those. You may want to take it more widely. But you're looking at things like likelihood, the magnitude of harm or perhaps opportunity. Some climate change um, uh, does impact will be an opportunity. So, for example, warmer um, summers do mean that you can have more of an outdoor economy. Wetter winters do mean you'll sell more peculiar wellies. So, you know, there are opportunities there, too. But thinking about the time frame, how, how soon will the risk apply? How complex is the risk? Because if you don't own all of the risk and you're reliant on another part, that makes it more important that you start investigating it. And you may have other criteria, and I've already spoken about vulnerable communities and the impact on vulnerable communities. So this is um, the guidance that's coming out of Hearts County Council at the moment. This is again in the draft. And this is thinking about the things that we might consider impact types. So we've got service disruption, we've got injury uh, or severity, financial impact, media coverage, complaints, fines, and how it impacts on our strategic objectives. And there's an attempt here, this is very draft, but there's an attempt here to actually put a quantifiable uh, numbers on this to make it easier for people to apply it. You can see the same here with how we um, evidence likelihood, and then you can multiply the two, and you get your impact grid. That tells you where your priorities are. Obviously, the red ones are the ones that you really want to deal with very, very quickly or as quickly as you can. So here's Cardiff again, and I picked this because it's quite interesting. You can see that they've gone for the uh, highest consequence rating is the one that they ascribe. They've described it slightly differently. People, assets, reputation and finance. It's, it's very similar. So they've taken their, uh, their consequence, their risk, They've picked up what the rationale might be, and then they've given it a risk rating. What you can see on this top one is that the risk increases over time. So if they do a cost benefit analysis, which I would imagine they would do, they certainly should do, then they may choose not to take action now if it's a lowish risk, but to make sure that action is taken by the 2050s in time for um, the high risks of the, uh, the 2080s. What you can see down here is that there's a medium-ish risk 
and that goes to quite a high risk by um, 2050. So that's something you'd want to start work on um, much sooner. Um, but you can also, let's go on. Having done that, you've identified what your potential risks are. You will probably find that there's a lot of work already going on to mitigate or reduce those risks. So it might be things like planning laws, or it might be things like temporary barriers or whatever, whatever. But identifying those is really important. You can also do a very quick win um, exercise here and identify where you know what to do and you can just do it. It's something relatively simple. Move a service. If it's a pub in York that floods every year, you put your beer um, uh, barrels upstairs and you pump the beer by gravity and your regulars go in wearing their Wellingtons every year. Uh, it's just known. It was a simple thing to do back in the 80s. That's what they did. Um, so you can then reassess the risks to make sure where there's an active reduction measure in place or immediately programmed, you don't count that one. Get it off the list so that you've got a manageable list. So here's Cardiff again. And what we can see is that, oops, beg your pardon. They um, have identified that they've got this higher risk um, but they're, and the residual rating stays the same. But here, where they had the uh, high risks at the, at the current time, they've been able to manage that down. It's still going to go up again, but for the time being, here in the bird activities, they know how to manage that down. So it, it gives you an idea of what your priorities need to be. We're back on birds again. So then creating the adaptation action program, well, obviously work on the highest priority risks first. It, in some cases, it will be very obvious what you need to do. It might just be that you need money. Uh, there'll be others where it is much more tricky and you're going to have to do some investigation. It's really important to log what it is you need to do. It isn't just solve the problem. If you need to do a cost benefit analysis, log that you need to do that. If you need to find out more information, log that you need to do that. And then create the program of work in the degree of urgency. So what needs to happen now? What's on the medium boil a burner? Except it won't be a burner, will it? It'll be a halogen hob. And what's on the back halogen hob? And then the... Um, Adaptation reporting program from Her Majesty's government makes this point at the end. The resulting program should be assessed against sustainability principle and whether they, that's the actions, would be viable in a low carbon economy. So if you've got loads of stuff that's um, demanding um, energy or whatever else, so like air conditioning in to deal with a particular problem in a building, is that going to be sustainable in a low carbon economy? It's encouraging you to make that check. And then we come on to the adaptation program itself. It really isn't a good idea to have um, your adaptation program sitting separately on a shelf, the responsibility of a safety manager or something like this. Think of it like health and safety. It's about embedding it into existing structures and functions wherever you can. And the subsidiarity principle, make responsibility for the risk as low as you can. So in the same way that you would tell a baggage handler that they have to look after the work, their back in the way that they lift baggage, you might say the same to the baggage handler about making sure they wear a cap, drink water and put sunscreen on in climate change uh, situation, uh, a, a heat wave. Also make risk identification an ongoing function. It is recommended that you um, monitor the effectiveness of the adaptation program centrally each year. But if you've got a service that identifies a new risk, it's a bit daft to wait a year before bringing it to anyone's attention, particularly if it needs dealing with quickly. And review the whole programme on a regular basis. The um, uh, adaptation reporting programme recommends five yearly and requires strategic infrastructure providers to provide a report to government um, each for every five years. And it's received by DEFRA and assessed by DEFRA. And they use that to look at how the UK PLC, if you like, is doing in terms of climate change adaptation. So I uh, back to Cardiff because I think this is quite useful. You can see that they've categorised the actions here and said what they need to do. So it's very clear which ones are feasibility. So one here, scoping, monitoring and identifying impacts and risks where they don't know enough about the risks. Two, they want to do a bit more to think about the impacts and risks with other stakeholders, probably where there's interdependencies. Three is where they know what they want to do and they've just got to get on and do it. And four is where they've got to evaluate and see whether what they thought would work is actually going to work. So different types of functions are recorded in the plan. They also say who owns it. They say when it needs to happen. 
And as you would with any action plan as you were today, um, they go through the status of the actions that have been planned and, and, and what's going on with them. They also talk about the experiences that they've had, because in 2030 or 2050, it's quite likely that some of the people working on this programme now will not be working for Cardiff Airport. Um, so they try to record a data trail, an audit trail, so that someone in the future can work out what they did and why and the problems that they came across and how they dealt with them. So it's a bit like um, decommissioning a nuclear power station. I discovered to my surprise that a lot of the details of safety critical details in nuclear power stations are written on uh, by lead free pencil on acid free paper. And that is because when they are needed, that is the only technology that they can guarantee is likely to still be around. If you think back to your 12 inch floppy disks all those years ago. Uh, so uh, it's quite a surprise, but it's trying to help future proof your climate change adaptation strategy. So um, this is the last slide, but some more information for you, things that you might find useful or interesting. Um, if you want to have a, a look at the, car, at the um, Cardiff Airport um, report, it's very, very accessible and I think interesting. And that's the uh, third bullet point. Cambridge have done uh, quite a lot of work on uh, climate change adaptation. That's worth a read. UK government advice to local authorities. You might be better going back to the 2009 uh, guidance if you want something clear that was produced uh, when uh, Local Agenda 21 and such like were happening. But I've given you the most recent link here. And the last one is the HM government guidance for national infrastructure operators. And again, that's interesting, particularly if you need to deal with, um, uh, what are they called now? National highways or um, the rail companies or others and the health authorities as well. Health authorities also have to report. So it might be useful to find out what they are actually doing. If you want to find out more of what's going on at Hearts County Council, Julie Greaves is the most appropriate um, contact and, and Georgina can get in touch with her. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really happy to give you any other information or uh, help that uh, I can tonight. So uh, I'll pass back to the chair if that's okay. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that uncompromisingly direct and honest presentation. Um, I really appreciated how you made it quite clear that climate change affects everyone and everything, whether you believe in it or not. It also makes quite clear that the level of urgency of which we all need to be acting with. Um, does anybody have any questions for Lynn? Hands up or digital hands up, please. I see uh, Kimberly, you're waving. Hello, thanks so much um, for that, Lynn. Uh, really useful. Um, I was just, I had a question about how many of you on this call have read, um, I'm here representing along with Kate, the Heart Community Group. Uh, how many of you have read our report, which we submitted in November, which was specifically about adaptation? Um, and if you haven't, I would, um, I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the, uh, the chat here if anybody wants to read it. Um, so you can go and have a look at that if you haven't. But um, it, Lynn, you, you, you seem to be assuming, and, and they were all great examples, but that um, all of your adaptation measures are pretty much assuming that life is going to continue as it is going forward, pretty much with the same system, the same economy, the same... Um, and yeah, and I wondered if you'd come across things like transformative adaptation or deep adaptation, uh, rather than just what's often called defensive or shallow adaptation. Certainly, I think um, it's looking at whether you are trying to continue the activity or, want, or whether you want to do the activity differently. There's an interesting adage, isn't there? Do you want to do uh, the same, th uh, more of the same thing or do you want to do the same thing better? Um, the examples I've given you are ones where there is a lot of government guidance around how the adaptation strategy is to be produced. And in the case of airports in particular, um, it's a business. I have my own views on airports as an um, individual, as a professional. I'm trying to make them as good as I can because uh, it's my job. Um, but yes, I do think there will be some situations where we have to choose to do different things. So if I live in, um, in, in um, Ironbridge tonight, 
I would be really, really wondering whether I want to go back to live in Ironbridge or whether I should be moving back. If I lived on the coast, I wouldn't have a choice because so much coast is not defended. Um, and that's usually on a cost benefit analysis. But if I live in Ironbridge, it is defended because it's a historic heritage area, et cetera, et cetera. But we are going to have to make decisions about some of the things we can defend and some of the things we can't defend. And, we're, and that will be huge culturally. That will have some massive issues. It's things like um, in our conservation areas, and I'm a resident, by the way, of North Hertfordshire, so I'm really keen to get this right. Um, but, in, um, but in North Hertfordshire, I, um, you've got conservation areas where it's very, very difficult to retrofit. And we have to think very carefully about the marriage between conservation and livability, unless we've got another plan for all the buildings which won't be habitable. So it's quite, that's quite a serious thing. That the, the house I was talking about was in Letchworth Conservation Area, the one I renovated, and I had to do everything internally, and I have the know-how and I had the willingness to do so. But for an awful lot of people, it is quite expensive. You do lose a bit of living space and it is difficult and there is risk attached to it. So we have a job to do, I think, as technical experts and for you as a local authority, and I differentiate between the two, my responsibility is technical, but to help and find ways to enable people to do that. If we want to carry on having these historic and heritage buildings being livable, it's, it's um. It's dilemma and there will be more. There'll be more around um, what do we do about shortage of water? Do we go with the government? The government at the moment is looking at national transfer schemes um, between different um, water catchment areas. And there's massive um, plans for that and for the infrastructure that goes alongside that. There'll be embodied carbon in that disruption, et cetera, et cetera. But it will mean that we'll be able to get water. Um, but, you know, we were going to have to think about things like reservoirs, covers for reservoirs, et cetera, et cetera. We're also going to have to think, interestingly, in France, in areas which are impoverished, um, there is a requirement for supermarkets and other air conditioned private sector buildings to stay open during heat waves 24 seven. And that is so that people can get in there and cool down so they don't die. And we are really going to have to think about cool as a service. Mm -hmm. And that's a new thing. We don't, we've never done this before. So we, we really get some of the deep changes that you're talking about, Kimberly. I don't know if that's what you meant, but some of these changes are going to be really quite fundamental. That won't be picked up unless someone does a climate change adaptation um, strategy for people living in poverty or vulnerable populations. And you can see some of the hits with this now, if you're looking at COVID implications for those who've had to stay in or have had to pay extra to have things delivered or whatever else it is. You know, we know that there is a substantial part of the population which struggles with things like this. And that's a kind of a, for me, that's a social duty. But, you know, I would be very clear here. I'm not a politician and I don't make policy. I can suggest and advise. And there will be, uh, frankly, there are going to be limits to what a local authority can do because it's about enabling you can't do it for someone or make someone do something. Thank, Thank you. you, Lynn. Can I, Kimberly, does that answer your question? Um, yes, for the moment. But as I say, I would, I would thoroughly, if you haven't read it, have a look at our report because we're, we're coming from a much deeper, more transformative place than, um, than simply kind of risk assessment and trying to, trying to pretend that business can go on as usual. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a digital hand up, which is Councillor Steve Jarvis. Uh, thanks. I mean, I think two, two points, one of which I guess is a question, and one of which is more of an observation. Um, I mean, from a, from a point of view of local government, there, there are kind of two aspects to adaptation, it seems to me. There's, there's and this comes back to your definition of assets, services and systems, I, I suppose. I, I can see that as a, a local authority, we might run a leisure facility um, and the same sort of questions as apply to an airport get apply there. Is, is, the, is the fabric of the building going to be damaged by flood or excessive temperature or, or something of that sort? Can we continue to provide the service? Um, can people get there? Those kind of things. Um, and in some respects, that's simpler than the other part of what local government is involved in, which is for the community as a whole, where the system is 
is the district, which is part of, of, of the country. Um, and in the first case, you know, we can make a plan and, and well, we probably don't have enough money to do all the things we'd like to do. There would be physical constraints, financial constraints, but in principle, we can identify what we might need to do to make our leisure centers so they didn't flood, um, so they didn't fall down when it got too hot, so people could get to them. Um, some of those things might be challenging, but they're nowhere near as challenging as how do you do it for the community as a whole, where what you have to do, is some things you, you need to deliver, some you need to encourage others to deliver. Um, so that means it's a bigger issue for local government than it is for someone who's running an airport or a hospital. I mean, have I, have I understood correctly there? Yes, you have. And I think I sort of alluded to this earlier on. Um, and one of the similes I'd give you is flood risk partnerships. Yeah. Um, I presume, I mean, I've worked with those in Scotland and that is about enabling all different players to come together to tackle a specific geographic challenge. So it's a spatial challenge, usually speaking. Um, there will be other things that need to be looked at. So if, if we were to do a local overheating strategy, we know that overheating is going to be a major issue. Mm -hmm. So what would we do to help with adaptation for that? Who would we need to get to? Who would we need to help? And what would we do in a critical incident like a heat wave? So you can do it, but you're picking it up thematically. It's very, very difficult to do an all encompassing plan. And again, the work I've seen done, I'm trying to think of the best example. I've looked at Cambridge, it's good. And, and Kirk Cleese did work on this back in the 90s. And that, that was quite interesting in sort of picking particular housing types that needed attention or particular demographic areas that needed attention on the index of multiple deprivation. So it's about, I think it will be about prioritisation because I completely agree with you, Councillor Jarvis. It's almost impossible for you to just do, to do a district climate change adaptation plan that does everything. And to do it alone, in some areas, you're, you know, you're an enabler and in other areas, you're just a supporter. Yeah, and clearly it's not possible to do alone. It's the question to which it's possible to do at all. Um, because it, it, the other thing is the more complex the system, not only is it more complex to arrange what the solution might be, but it's more complex to identify what the problem is. We don't necessarily understand the areas that will be susceptible um, to excessive temperatures, for example. You know, there will, there will, there will be geographies that result in the temperature locally being higher than it is in other places. We probably don't understand where that might be a problem. So there, are there are technical ways to do that, but yes, your point is well made. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next hand up is Nikki Clark. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. That was a fantastic presentation. I thought really interesting. Um, I've just got a, a question to throw out there. Um, uh, thinking about our re uh, re reliance on the internet and electronic communication. Is that somewhere where we should be, have some sort of backup plan? I live in a really rural, little in Langley and very rural and our internet goes out when it's cold. So I can imagine communications might be a, a problem. There's um, a national climate change um, adaptation program, which is worth a look. I think it's either on Bayes or DEFRA's website. Um, Georgina, I don't know if you, could do a quick Google and see if you can find it. Um, but the telecoms, the national telecoms infrastructure and power infrastructure is covered by the um, uh, Climate Change Act 2008. And they are two of the critical operators um, who are required to, to plan for this type of thing. Obviously, if you get severe wind and it knocks everything out, we're all uh, in trouble for a little while. What, you know, mobile phone masks go down. The mobile phone masks go down. Um, so, yeah. I would have a look at, at the national picture. That's again about the subsidiarity thing that I suspect is not something that a district council would usually be able to manage unless, you know, unless it had a private energy generation supply, which is unlikely here, I think. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, was anyone waving their hands? Sorry. Yes. 
I guess I have another question. Um, Go on, Steve. It's not, but it's not necessarily a, a question for Lynn. It may be a question for, for Georgina. Um, in terms of what what point HCC SP has got to from working on, on some of these issues, um, because you know once we get beyond the adaptation at the at the individual asset level, and I mean uh, assets assets in some contexts are systems in others, aren't they? But uh, um, once we get beyond that kind of very localized level, then this is even more difficult for individual bits of local government to do on its own than some of the other things we've been talking about. So what's how's HCCSP going to approach this? Do we know yet? Um, I can try and answer it. I think, Lynn, you are on the subgroup, aren't you, for adaptation, so you might want to chip in if I get it wrong. Um, but I think it kind of got to a point where they were looking at creating these risk assessments for the whole county, I believe, looking not just at impacts on council service delivery, but much more broadly. Um, but I think they were finding that they didn't necessarily have the right people in the, in the room to kind of create a risk assessment like that, because it, it's often kind of um, climate change officers or um, policy officers that, that were on the subgroup. And I think they wanted to try and find um, people that have more um, experience with either risk risk um, assessment or adaptation or something. Um, so they've kind of gone back, I think, a bit to the drawing board. Um, is that, am I on the right lines, Lynn? Or have yeah, it's a bit, a bit yeah. of a rethink because it was duplicating work that local authorities already do on um, emergency response. So your emergency planner um, already knows what to do if there's a flood. Um, you, don't, you don't need us to tell you again. So um, at the moment, there's thinking about whether we should go to something thematic or whether we should provide advice to local authorities about how to approach particular aspects of that. And that needs to be tested back with HCCSP. Um, so the two officers who are running it, and I, I support them, as I said, it's not my responsibility, but I support them technically, but they're having a, a bit of a rethink as to what the, the county level work can actually do. So if um, councillors here wanted to make recommendations to Georgina about what they would like out of the county approach, that would probably be quite beneficial because the wish to have the strategy is there, but I think what it actually needs to do is less clear at the moment. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Ruben, this is also your area a little bit. Do you want to bring in anything? I did, just to reshape what Lynn and Georgina have said, I had a very brief meeting with those two officers who are who have the um, who are leading the subgroup for adaptation, and they. They had, as Lynn said, they've reviewed the resilience plans that are already out there and they don't want to duplicate that, but they wanted to make sure they had the right people around the table because, as Lynn's presentation has said to us, it's, it's a complex issue. There'll be many different inputs and it won't be the likes of me or Georgina who are enthusiastic about this, but we need some technical geniusness to actually identify the issue, get the process and then get that, that solution at the end, as, as, as Lynn has said, really. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Are there any other questions or comments from anybody? I'm afraid I had another one. <laughs> oh, go on, Steve. Well, I mean, just arising from that, you know, so two points. Firstly, you know, as as um, as Lynn said, you know, that there's a um, there are the emergency plans that look to deal with the impact of, of what happens when a flood occurs. Um, but one's adaptation could either be looking at how you handle the flood or alternatively how you prevent the flood from happening when there is pro more prolonged rainfall. Uh, and and you know, essentially, if, it, if, if it's more likely to happen more often, then the case for switching from um, you know, buying some sandbags and, and dealing with it in, in an emergency planning way to making some changes to the, to the drainage system in order to prevent it happening, you know, the, the, the trade-offs of those vary depending on frequency. So, so you, you might choose a different route and it might not be the emergency planning route. And I think the second thing I was gonna say was it sounds to me as if you know, all local authorities already have systems for managing risks to their operations. Uh, and in terms, of the, in terms of the kind of asset related stuff, I guess one should probably add on to that rather than create a, a completely separate system to manage 
uh, climate related risks compared with other risks because some of these risks are inter interact apart from everything else. So is, is, but I've, once again, I guess the question is, have I misunderstood that? Is that a silly thing to suggest? Um, if it's for me to respond, Chair, then I would say, no, that's eminently sensible. Um, climate change risk is a risk, and you already have a risk management framework. So where you're dealing with assets, um, expanding the framework to deal with climate change makes complete sense because it's already in place and people understand it and they know why they're doing it. Services is slightly different. Um, I would be surprised if there is a risk management process in quite the same way for services, but that's more of a system. It is worth a look at that, you know, particularly when you're thinking about, are you going to be able to take 12 people who are elderly to a day centre in a minivan that gets too hot, or however it's powered? You know, so, um, you know, it would need to be cooled in some way. So it's starting to think about the services. If Meals on Wheels is delivered by volunteers, I don't know how it works here, but if it's dealt with, delivered by volunteers, are they going to be able to do it if it's pouring with rain? You know, that, that kind of question, which is not asset related, is worth a look. So with this, uh, so the way you've just um, stated that with regards to climate change, it already is a risk. It's not. It's not like how you do a risk assessment of the things that could happen. It's management of what is going to happen and how it's happening. It's, it's not as if we can do things to avoid it in this fashion. It's how we manage it with what there already is. Councillor Jarvis, really, <laughs> Councillor Jarvis made a really good observation, Chair, when he said um, it's, it's, it's about preventing things in the first place. But it's also yeah. about adapting so that maybe, again, if I, if I pick York, I worked there for six years. And strangely, I'm familiar with the pub that floods a lot. But the, there was work there done to make sacrificial ground floors and cellars. So parking was always put on the ground floor because you can move a car. And it doesn't matter if it floods, it will recover services going in at first floor level. In Arica in Scotland, um, decisions were made about moving people in residences from ground floors to first floor, and putting um, business premises underneath that people could just be moved from. So mm -hmm. there are some things that can be done by reordering what's already going on to live with the risk in a safe way, in the same way that you teach kids to swim rather than telling them never to go anywhere near the sea. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Can't see anyone waving and I can't see any hands up. Okay. Lynn, thank you so much for that. Um, Pleasure. Thank you. Right, well, that's come to an end. I will move over to any other business, um, which is to ask if Sue would like to present uh, any festivals and such that are happening this year or soon. So okay. Right to you. okay, well, in the last few weeks, there's been a certain amount of movement on this subject. And um, I think it's great that we can have some forward notice that Bulldog is planning an eco-fest on the 7th of May, Hitch in the 14th of May. Woolworth, I can't find the dates, but I know that they are planning something. And Letchworth may come up with something um, on the 10th of September. Now, Really, this is interesting to this panel because we have got plenty of notice in order for North Hearts Council and Hearts CC to actually make really good presentations and to get the public engaged with the things that we're talking about this evening. Now, it may not seem very obvious what those things are, but um, having had conversations earlier today, we were thinking really in terms of Sorry, I'm jumping the gun and I'm going to say exactly how we thought about it. That's Getting right. the public to actually engage with the kinds of things that they could be doing now and possibly are not thinking about. How to do this? Maybe, this is the suggestion, to have gazebos in each of the towns regularly on Saturdays and to invite people to come along with their suggestions or their questions and to get engagement on, on a really basic on a basic level. So that in fact, there could be some really quite punchy ideas that the council could be putting forward at the festivals and to continue this kind of process of engagement with the public. At the moment, it feels very much as if it's the council looking after us and that we as the, the voters and the, and the public 
are not actually doing very much unless we actually have the bit between our teeth and that happens to be our thing. But when I talk to my neighbours, it's just not on their agendas that they're, you know, putting on with their lives. So I'm really thinking that here we are in February, we've got lots of time. No, it's not lots of time. It's a few months to really start to think about these things. And if anybody on this panel would like to start thinking about how to engage the public, you know, it's a bit like the, um, um, the surgeries, to actually make the surgeries in, in the town centres with a gazebo and to be thinking about this specifically. Um, Diane, did you have anything to add to that? Because we were talking about it earlier. Where are you? Is she gone? Um, oh, yeah. I'm here. Um, okay. The, the festival Sue mentioned on the possibly on the 10th um, will be, we're thinking a rerun of Green Festival from last year. Um, Love Letchworth is working out whether or not they can help us with that at the moment. Uh, it won't happen if they can't. So, but um, I think the other thing about that particular festival and maybe because that's September and it's a, it's a way off, um, it would be easier for the council to prepare something um, for that than it would be to prepare something for the um, Baldock Eco Fest Fest on the 7th of May or the Hitchin one on the 14th. But last year at the, um, at the Green Festival, uh, it was mostly the council's presentation was a stall with um, from Waste to Wear, mostly about recycling and that sort of thing. But um, I was wondering if this year um, it, they could uh, up the ante. No, that's the wrong expression. But um, ha have some presentations of what climate change actually means for our communities so that, uh, you know, it, it explains what the council, maybe it will be a talk that you could give or a stall or both but explaining what the council's policies are, what their problems are, and how they would like the general public to be involved and to help them to achieve some sort of adaptation. Um, so is that right, Sue? Do you think yeah, I think so. I think it's getting on board as early as we can to make it a much more um, thought out and um, you know, well-researched um, activity from the council this time round. I think, you know, we, it's an ideal opportunity is what I'm saying, because we've got a council that's on our side on this whole thing, but um, it needs now to be um, visible. That, that's really it. I don't know what kind of things the council could be putting. I mean, I do remember a long time ago when um, the brown, what I call the, the Dalek bins, the composters, were available at a very low price through the council. Now that may not any longer be possible, but there may be things that we can think of that would in fact, with some thought and with some planning, um, be, be um, considered for the festivals if we got ourselves organized now. That's really what I'm all about. Thank you. Um, just in response to, um, as the person who was, as the councillor who was there with the uh, recycling and waste team, and the waste aware we were there as the recycling and waste department and we were there to show the services that we provide and also to you know give as much information as we um could with you know in the capacity that we had and also we were there giving away um the food caddies and the compostable bags and other bits and pieces um with some information and uh we were there as I was there as a counselor, and the officers were there on their day off doing um, doing this for the day. So um, there's that. But in yes, we are we we'd be very happy to um, come again. I'm certain. But with regards to um, presenting on uh, environmental issues, instead of being there as, as the recycling just the recycling and waste team, we um, would ideally be there as the environmental panel to. Mm -hmm discuss everything like we've discussed tonight. However, that is obviously upon the availability of um, ourselves and our officers at that time. But i um, very grateful there's plenty of notice. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll then from now, we'll just see what we can do and what we can provide. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments about the upcoming festivals? 
to uh, for Sue and Diane. Yes. Hi, Val. Hi. Um, I'm on the WhatsApp group for the um, organisation of the Hitchin Eco Day, uh, which is plastic free Hitchin. So I'm sort of periphery of it. And so really it's, I think we need to be in contact with the organisers of the festivals. And maybe that's the way forward that the actual, the, the ideas that have been put forward just now, yeah. you know, we pass on to, for instance, in Hitchin. Annie Sandy and Abby Cuthbertson, so they can put it in their plans, because at the moment they are actually putting out for stalls, etc. But I say my, my involvement is as a member of that group, not as a councillor. Right. Point. Just for everybody's um, uh, information, Sue, could we have the dates again, please? Sure. I think I'm muted. Hang on. No, no, you're 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 still. Oh, I was all right, was I? Yeah. <laughs> I know. I've gone. I've moved. Still here. You're still here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, 7th of May, Baldock. 14th of May, Hitchin. Woolworth Common, I believe, is doing one. It might be June. I don't know. Yeah, I can't remember the date for that. And 10th of September, hopefully, Letchworth, but that's definitely to be confirmed. Sorry, that's that's great. a contradiction saying definitely to be confirmed. Anyway, work in progress. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Steve, you're waving your hand around. Yeah, I'm I mean, assuming I, it's not just for fun or anything. No, 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 for fun, that's something to say again. Um, I mean, I think that, I, I hope that the council can play a bigger role in the, in the future. I mean, I don't think, I don't think that all, we should underestimate the impact that all the other organisations had at and, and at Ballpark last year. I, mean, I wouldn't want it to turn into a thing that was predominantly the council. I'd like the council to be there supporting people, uh, supporting the event, talking about what it can do, but as part of, of those events, which actually in, included lots of other people, some of whom who were much, much better equipped to make some of the points, some of the particular points than the council probably is. So I think we need to be part of it. If there's things that we can do to make it happen, then I think we ought to try and do that. But it should be the council should be part of it rather than rather than it. If you see what I'm saying, uh, and I think we'll clearly have to have a discussion. As Amy has said, uh, there's an issue about people being available on particular dates, which was a problem I think for some of the events last last year. Um, but I think we need to see what we can do. Uh, because I very much like the council to play a, a bigger role in, in events of that sort in the future, uh, and helping the community make them better events. I Definitely don't. a bigger role, not all the roles. No, no, no. <laughs> it shouldn't be a council event, I don't think. It should be a, an event that the council helps with and participates in. Okay. Uh, just one sec. Okay. So, Sue, if I just bring you back in. So your hand's up and you're all on mute. Yeah, okay. No, I'm not. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very happy with that, with that point of view, Steve. It was simply really in the months leading up to it, that I really am quite concerned that we start to get a discussion going, a street, a street discussion between people and the council. So it's a greater understanding of what is happening and also to get more people on board. So it's not simply being channeled through political parties, but it's being actually done at a citizen level. That's really what I'm trying to say, that I don't think that it's, it's really getting home to an awful lot of people. And prior to those festivals, I think it'd be wonderful if we could really build that conversation. That's my point. Uh, okay. So sorry, I wasn't on mute then as I was just changing my cable. Um, thank you. Uh, are there any other uh, questions or comments uh, or is there any, any other business? Nobody's waving, no digital hands are up. Okay, right. Uh, well, in that case, I shall be bringing this session to a close. And I'd just like to say thank you so much for all of you uh, for attending. Lynn, thank you so much for your presentation. And thank you so much to all the officers and other councillors who have attended tonight and uh, Louis for running and hosting. So thank you very much, everybody. And good night. Good night. Thank you.